yellow warning in place for the winds here and for the rain in Northern Ireland. Cause some problems today with more rain and hill snow here tomorrow. Again, that could cause further disruption. Nowhere immune from the downpours though during Thursday and uh, for most of us going to feel pretty chilly as well. Temperatures while struggling to get to double digits and feeling colder with the wind and the rain. As we go through the long weekend, signs of the weather getting at least a little drier. Better chance of seeing some sunshine on Good Friday, particularly over Northern England and East in England in the morning. Showers will develop almost everywhere by the afternoon. Fewer showers on Saturday and Easter day at this stage looking largely dry and signs of things at least turning just a little warmer. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello, good evening. It's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. The Lord Chief Justice is considering taking away your most basic constitutional right, the right to trial by jury. We know that judges are increasingly politicised, funnily enough, always to the left of centre. But now, have they become drunk with power too? Public confidence in the National Health Service has reached the lowest point since this particular survey began 41 years ago, with some describing themselves as being in a toxic relationship with it. Is it now the time to restructure this bloated bureaucratic beast? And if so, how? More than 100 legislators have called on the government to suspend arms sales to Israel, our most important ally in the Middle East. But it is in times of need that we ought to stand closest to our allies. Plus, as the Baltimore Bridge collapses, could it happen here? We have asked the Department of Transport what measures it has taken to ensure no bridges collapse in the United Kingdom. I'll be relieving what, revealing what they said shortly. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by my most pugnacious panel, former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the historian and broadcaster, Tessa Dunlop. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now, it's what you've all been waiting for, the news of the day with Polly Middlehurst. There is creeping capture of the United Kingdom's judiciary. Earlier this week, at the Court of Appeal hearing of the Shamima Begin case, in which the defendant's legal team lost its bid to take its challenge to the Supreme Court, Lord Chief Justice Baroness Carr said it could be argued the decision in Ms Begum's case was harsh. It could also be argued that Ms Begum is the author of her own misfortune. But it is not for this court to agree or disagree with either point of view. The only task of the court 
was to assess whether the deprivation decision was unlawful. Since it was not, Ms. Begum's appeal is dismissed. Baroness Cart was exactly right. The role of the judiciary is to interpret the law. Whether a judge thinks Shamima Begum was treated harshly or not, indeed, I think she was treated harshly, is entirely irrelevant. Parliament writes and passes the law, the judiciary interprets it in our courts. But this statement from Lord Chief Justice seemed to contradict the fact that earlier this week she took an explicitly political position with respect to Garrick Club membership, prompting the four old women we discussed yesterday to resign. A leaked memo seen by The Guardian said, I wish to emphasise my commitment to diversity and inclusivity across the judiciary. We must continue our vital work in this area, including delivering on the work outlined in our diversity and inclusion strategy. It doesn't end here for the Lord Chief Justice. Not only does she seem to want to inject the judiciary with leftist groupthink, she also wants to take away from you one of the most basic of constitutional rights, the right to trial by jury. Under the guise of efficiency, Lord Chief Justice told BBC Radio 4 yesterday that as a means of clearing the court backlog, that consideration should be given to recalibrating which offences should be granted the option of being tried by jury or not. She acknowledged that this would limit the ability of a defendant to decide if they wanted their case to be heard by a jury. That is to say, limiting their are fundamental constitutional rights. Trial by jury is an ancient right confirmed in Magna Carta over 800 years ago. It is the cornerstone of the British justice system. And justice and efficiency are not necessarily bedfellows. In a competition between the two, justice must always win. There is a high risk that judges think they know it all and may become jaundiced by seeing too much evil in human nature. Juries may be more likely to find not guilty, although it could be that more often innocent people opt for trial by jury, trusting their fellow citizen more than an agent of the state. The English jurist William Blackstone once said, it is better that ten guilty men go free than that one innocent man suffer. But it seems the Lord Chief Justice is intent on turning the United Kingdom into a dystopian German-style legal system, where the ancient right of being tried by your peers is sidelined in favour of an elitist approach to justice with a sprinkling of woke ideology on top. As ever, let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. Well, I'm joined now by Joshua Rosenberg, the very distinguished legal commentator, um, who indeed carried out the interview. Um, Joshua, thank you very much for joining me. How important is this, and is it a real threat to jury trial, or, or was the Lord Chief Justice just floating a kite? I think the Lady Chief Justice was indeed floating a kite. Her starting point was the Conservative Party manifesto from 2019, in which the uh, current government promised to establish a royal commission on the criminal justice process. She pointed out that that never happened uh, during the present government. She thought it would be a good idea. She thinks some sort of uh, major long-term inquiry into the criminal justice process would be a good idea. Uh, when I asked her what it might consider, uh, she suggested that one area it could look at was what she called recalibrating what are called triable either way offences. Either way offences are offences that can be tried either by magistrates or in the Crown Court by a jury. Obviously, there are some offences that are so serious they must be tried by a judge and jury. Murder, for example. There are some uh, offences, many offences, which can only be tried by magistrates. Some, such as uh, theft, uh, burglary, may be tried by magistrates, may be tried by a judge and jury. The defendant has the right to choice, uh, to choose. And uh, what Lady Carr said is that uh, an inquiry might recommend uh, moving some uh, offences from those that you were entitled to a jury uh, into the category where you were not entitled to choose trial by jury, although I suppose the magistrates could send you for trial by jury. That's what she suggested, but it's something that uh, she personally is not backing. It's something that she thought uh, a full inquiry into the criminal justice system might recommend. But when somebody of her station starts floating ideas like that, it's an indication that it's something that she's open to, isn't it? It's not something that she would suggest if she were hostile to it. I think that's fair. Uh, she would certainly be open to it. But of course, as you rightly said, Jacob, it's not up to her to decide. It's a matter for Parliament. This would require legislation. The government of the day would have to consider the recommendations. Uh, past governments have tried limiting 
the right to trial by jury uh, and have not succeeded. I, I mentioned this to her. Uh, she's well aware that this is a highly controversial topic. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it would be uh, something that uh, could be considered. As she said, many cases are already summary only, which means they can be tried only by magistrates. But by and large, the summary only ones are the inevitably the less important ones, the ones less important to do fundamental damage to somebody's reputation and standing in society. That's perfectly fair. Um, and um, uh, there are many people whose convictions for offences of dishonesty would mean the end of their careers. Uh, and that is why uh, people, uh, and, and you've made this point very clear, uh, are wedded to trial by jury, uh, regarded as fundamental, as a safeguard. Uh, but there are other uh, offences uh, which uh, uh, people think can reasonably tried, uh, be tried by the magistrates. Uh, after all, uh, they have the power to send people to prison for 12 months if you're dealing with relatively low-level cases. I thought, I thought, uh, I thought were, six months, sorry. I thought it was reduced well, from you're right, 12 to you're 6. You're right. It's just, it was reduced from 12 to 6, and she says it should be put up to 12. Uh, but that, that uh, reduction, um, I was discussed that when I was in government yeah. at the time, yeah. that wasn't actually about the prison population. That was about 12 months being a very, very long time to take somebody's liberty away for without it being tried in front of a jury. That was part of the discussion that was taking place with people like the then Lord Chancellor. I think the point about that was that if you have uh, magistrates being able to uh, pass sentences of up to 12 months, which is what the government proposed uh, year before last and, and, and reversed last year, um, then you wouldn't have so many cases tried in the Crown Court. The magistrates uh, wouldn't need to send people to trial in the Crown Court. And in those circumstances, uh, that would reduce pressure uh, that's on the right. courts uh, and reduce backlogs. This is my biggest complaint, that this is being done for efficiency over justice. And to allow a stipendary magistrate, um, a, a district judge, to send somebody to prison for a year is giving enormous power to one person. That's right. And, and so that was reversed. The problem, of course, is that when magistrates could... Uh, send people to prison for up to 12 months. That was uh, increasing pressure on the prison population, not so much because uh, people were being sent to prison for longer, but, but they were being sent sooner. Uh, and with the prisons so full and under such pressure, I presume that was the reason why the government decided to reverse that well, and restore... As I say, months. in the discussions I was in, it was because um, of that fundamental idea that, that a year was a long time. But thank you very much, Joshua. Thank you for joining us and for your excellent uh, interview. Um, with me now is a friend of the programme, immigration lawyer Ivan Sampson. Ivan, thank you for coming in. Pleasure. I, mean, I hope my viewers are sitting down, because for once we agree, you actually believe that jury trial is a fundamental part of our constitutional system. Uh, it is, and it upholds the principles of uh, fairness and a just trial. What the jury trial does is selects ordinary people from the community to decide the innocence or guilt of the accused. Um, and otherwise, we're going to leave these decisions to legal professionals uh, or a single judge. And what you ensure is the views and, and um, perspectives of ordinary members of the public from a diverse range and background. And however brilliant judges are, they inevitably come from a certain segment of society. They have certain preconceptions. They, to an extent, are quite clubby. And they can't divest themselves of all of that when they're sitting in judgment. In, indeed. And what you there's a danger of um, wrongful convictions because what they don't have, they have subconscious bias. Uh, they become case hardened. Whereas the jurors will look at the evidence, taking into account their diverse backgrounds, perspectives, and viewpoints. So you get a much broader range of uh, assessment of the facts. I, I absolutely agree with you. I actually did jury service in the Middlesex Guild Hall, which is now where the Supreme Court is. And obviously, I'm not allowed to go into the details of who was there and so on. But it was a complete cross-section of society, people bringing with them very different attitudes towards crime, towards the police, but everybody taking it really seriously and recognising that what they thought could send somebody into prison. And it was done very seriously. 
It's also important because it educates the, the public on how the legal system works, how evidence is gathered, how evidence is prevented, presented, how arguments are made and how verdicts are reached. It's a very important part of uh, the cohesion and a fair and democratic society. You need that involvement of the public. Look, when a jury makes a decision, which I may not like, but because it's the jury made it, then I accept it because it's representative of the community. Also, I've always thought that if I were accused of something I had not done, I would much rather put my trust in the hands of 12 randomly selected people than one person who is part of the whole system. He's paid by the state. Uh, he's used to being with people in the state, as you say, may well be case-hardened, whereas 12 of your peers are going to give you a much better chance of putting your case fairly. You're protecting human rights, Jacob. Well done. Well, I'm not. I'm protecting <laughs> the ancient rights that we have enjoyed so since 1215. That's really good. It's absolutely right. And There's an opportunity to talk about Magna Carta, because, you know, one of the most fascinating things about Magna Carta is it coincides uh, with the Fourth Lateran Council, which bans trial by ordeal. The priest may not bless it. And in England, we go for trial by jury because it's just been announced in Magna Carta as the favoured system. And on the continent, they go for trying to get confessions, and that leads to much more torture as a continental practice than here. And those systems, the investigatory approach on the continent and the trial by jury adversarial approach here, are born out of the coincidence of Magna Carta and the Fourth Lateran Council. This always fascinated mm. me, and it is such a fundamental protection of our liberty. It is, and what, why did that happen? Because to promote trust and confidence in the judicial system. Because unless we have a jury trial, I think that's going to be seriously eroded. Um, we need to have total trust uh, in the way the judicial system works. It has to be open, transparent and accountable. And I'm disappointed, to use that disappointing word, um, that the Lord Chief Justice has flown this kite when you would have hoped that she would be a great defender of the justice of our judicial system. Indeed, I agree with you. And, and I think it's economic reasons because the courts are clogged up. I think there are about 60,000 cases waiting in the Crown Court. I've got private defendants who have, could be on, um, on bail waiting for trial for years. Well, the court structure, when I was doing jury service, seemed to me to be designed for idlers, that you were arrived late, you got sent home early, you hardly worked a full day. Seems to me if they pulled their finger out and actually did a full day's work, they could get through a lot more cases. Indeed. I mean, when I was a young lawyer working in the Crown Court, we had as little as three or four hours of actual work done. So and the message so... to the Lord Chief Justice is do some work and don't take away our constitutional rights. Indeed, we're, we're in agreement. We're in agreement. <laughs> Ivan and I are in agreement. That's fantastic. Coming up, as the British public describes their toxic relationship with the NHS, I'll be asking my pugnacious panel if it's time to change the health service. And don't forget the very important question of whether what happened to the Baltimore Bridge could happen here in the United Kingdom. We will be answering for this evening's finale. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. So many of you have been getting in touch over the WASPy issue. And actually, I just want to bring forward a view from Tony, uh, who has written in to say uh, something that we haven't included in this conversation well, on, so then. far. Tony says it was well publicised. Stop all the crying. His words. He says the Pensions <laughs> Act 1995 provided for this change. It was marginally sped up in 2010. But the fundamental issue, the WASPy issue, didn't come about in 2010 or 2011. It came about in 1995. Yeah, people, people know that the, the legislation was earlier, but the problem was is a lot of women weren't told. Beverly, who's a WASPy woman, has written in saying, were the WASPy women living under a stone? I am one of the women who was affected by this change. My peers and I were fully aware of the changes. It was widely discussed on TV, radio and in the newspapers as soon as the decision was made. We weren't happy at the time, but we recognised that it was 
fair. So it's wrong to spend billions in this way. I'd rather the post office people who suffered so much were reimbursed. Well, so I think for the social contract to work mm. and for our society to be cohesive and harmonious, if that's possible, <laughs> you can't just have <laughs> people who, 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 who don't work or don't, or don't have much have all the, receive all the, all the benefit. Well, now you're arguing against people. You're saying that people should have, in, to some extent, have looked in 1995 when the change happened. But, but fundamentally, it's not, just, it's not just waspy women who've been screwed over since the financial crisis. We have a 70-year high tax burden. Someone earning uh, £60,000 this year will pay more tax than someone earning £60,000 has, uh, has ever had to pay before. Yeah, but Tom, Tom, you These do realise this isn't the first time that we've well. had hugely high uh, tax rates on income. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Well, we've been discussing the judiciary and jury trials and you've been firing in your mail mogs. Steve says, seems that bit by bit, Parliament is chipping away at our Magna Carta. Soon, all our sacred rights will be taken away. And David says, when you have judges allowing protesters to walk free because they have a just cause, it's the judges that should be got rid of, not the juries. And Paul says... Hardened criminals with a string of convictions will keep on requesting jury trials for the sake of it. They will continue to waste public funds and also drain legal age funds to boot. Time to change. I disagree with you, Paul. Um, just because you've been guilty of one thing may not mean that you're guilty of the next thing. Are you satisfied with your relationship? Do you feel like you're in a toxic, vicious circle with your partner? Are you properly and promptly attended to and cared for? Before this continues on the path of a loose women segment, I'll interrupt it by saying these are all the concerns raised by the public in a new report about confidence in the NHS. Indeed, terms such as toxic relationship have been used as data reveal satisfaction with the health service is at an all-time low and that only a quarter of people feel it's functioning properly. For years, we've been told that simply pouring more money into the country's largest employer will work. But we spend about 11% of GDP on our health service, similar to levels spent in Japan, France, Germany, and more than in Australia. But these countries' health systems seem to be getting on better than our own. So is it time for a fundamental shift towards an insurance-based system? But with me now is my most pugnacious panel, former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the historian and broadcaster, Tessa Dunlop. Um, Tessa, you've got masses of notes on this. What have you said in your notes about changing the NHS? Are you suggesting very gently there through the back door of undermining the sacred cow that is the NHS? An insurance system is code for should we start charging and get rid of a system that's free at point well, of contact? Actually, I'm interested in the one person who's talking about reforming the NHS is Wes Streeting, the Labour shadow spokesman. And he has made this a credible topic for conversation before he started talking about it. Nobody dared mention talk, this sacred cow, as you correctly put it. Well, I think in many respects there are huge advantages to the NHS. It's a very centralised organisation. We saw how quickly and effectively we were able to roll out the COVID vaccinations as a result of that. And our buying power on the international pharmaceutical market is an in incredible, our muscle, in, com in comparison with the sort of more federal <laughs> buying power of America or Germany, say. All right. Well, but I haven't finished. That was just me warming up. All right. Anyway. I, 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 I think I've heard enough, right. but thanks very because, much. Because I just want to... You now just, back to the oh, just quickly, he, you mm. talked about never-ending money. The 24% the, the of people who are satisfied today, do you know how many people were satisfied with the NHS in 2010? 70%. 
Thank you very much. So what's changed between now and 2010? It's got uh, much COVID. more money. It's got no, tons more money. We've had a conservative and a lot, government. And, and We've had a conservative point government. A, COVID and B, a lot more money. money. And so the issue that really boils down to is it doesn't seem to work. We can't seem to work in the same place. My, my partner had to go to A&E about, oh, must be about six months ago. Honestly, I have seen smaller crowds at Charlton. It was absolutely horrendous there. And at least three people there actually were in, in handcuffs, right? So it, uh, it, it, something is not working in the A&E sense, and something is not working in the GP sense. The GPs want to make it work. So why don't we try another system alongside the NHS? And do you know what people are worried about? They're worried about that it becomes a secondary system. The, the, the insurance, you charge your insurance against your taxes and actually you will pay less tax. We are paying too much money. And the funny other fact, that this is a hilarious fact that emerged in this uh, King's Fund uh, analysis, was that 48% said um, we should uh, pay more tax uh, to, to do it, right? 47% of the country don't pay any tax. You, any, everybody wants a free hit in this world, and but, they're not getting just, it anymore. Could we just crunch the numbers here? Because Jacob, in his slightly disarming way, said that more and more money gets poured into the system. Yes, but life has got hugely more expensive. So while your government says 165, 165 billion pounds into the NHS more than ever before, actually per head, but, but this is 1.6% less per head. But surely it's the international comparators that matter. No, but it isn't. But there's a percentage of GDP we're similar but, but, to but, Germany, Australia, Switzerland. But, but we're not per head. Why are you we're against, not, insu why are you not, against insurance? Sure, we are not. Why are you against and you, it's a monopoly run by a trade right. union? What right. other what, how will it work? It's exactly like I, I, the railways. I just you, whenever there's a monopoly, you're done right, for. But actually, per head, we have an why, increased Why are you against insurance? An what is wrong with being insured? Pop. Trade unions have bupa but, and the like but, given to their but, members. But, Tertia, it's the percentage of GDP that really matters because that shows what you can afford proportionate to your GDP and it also relates to the wages in your country and, rather than the translations per head. And do you know what the brutal truth is? Under the Conservatives, since 2010, we have fallen down the OECD list of countries. We now sit below Italy in terms of wealth GDP per head, and I'm afraid we can park that. You can say, oh, Ukraine, COVID. I, no, they were international factors. Can... The Brexit was one of the things that no, busted wasn't. the flush of our British Brown. Brown. Who we are broke the We are poor, and, and we can't but... afford international nurses we and doctors. What we, what we should do is just well, introduce an insurance system to run alongside the NHS. We're going to come I on. guarantee yeah. you Don't that point. I it's guarantee you. Terribly you. To point. Let me point at the well, viewers. Right, fish slice, I want to get a word in edgeways. Well, speaking of the National Health Service, it's no secret, the large proportion of the UK's net migration figures are made up of people coming to work for the NHS or in social care. About 20% of care workers are foreign-born, as are about 17% of NHS workers. While I believe these numbers need to come down, I don't agree with the assessment of the International Council of Nurses, which has accused the UK's health and social care migration of being, quote, a new form of colonialism. It seems just about anything can be called colonialism nowadays. However, I want to ask Kelvin about this because he once suggested we should sack all NHS nurses who go on strike and replace them with people from the Philippines, not least because they're more grateful for the work. Yeah, Kelvin. Which, which is entirely my point. I have never seen anything so disgusting in my life as actually either A, nurses, B, consultants, C, quotes, junior, unquotes, doctors going on strike. People who you rely on actually to save your old mum, OK, fine, let them die. So on that basis, I would simply get rid of them. And I would do, by the way, exactly that with the railway drivers as well. Anybody who is in a position of authority in which they can actually mean that hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of people either can't get to work, can't get treated or can't do something because they are state organised has to be taken okay, on. So does that, make you, does that make you a okay, colonialist? Let me tell you. How do you think whopping worked? Yes. Right, tens whopping of was... thousands of people chanting at chanting every day. Eventually, they lost, and actually it extended the life of the news media by probably thirty years. But the thing is, whopping. And, unless isn't... you take people on, you all you will get is more and more bullying, and the bullying that goes on in the NHS. It's but... no surprise that we don't have a good system. There's always been a, a glut of wannabe journalists, and there is currently a 
global shortage of health workers. I've told you this before, so let me say it again slowly. Okay. There is a global shortage of health workers. That so means what? we so have what? to pay and We more. are in a fortunate position we... of being able to change their lives. They come from okay. very, very let poor backgrounds. Let... No, no, I'm telling you that, in fact, I am delighted that we are a successful Western liberal economy rescuing people from actual penury oh. and have, Could... being able to have decent well, lives. Let's get to... Let's Could I, I, as I often mention, am married to a Romanian. During the Brexit campaign, when there was vociferous campaigning against the immigrant, I was in Romania and you were constantly bombarded in train stations, online, in adverts, expensive adverts, our NHS aggressively recruiting their doctors and nurses to the extent that there was a joke in Bucharest that if you went to the medical school, it meant you were going overseas. And do you know what the Romanians were able to do in 2018 when they looked and thought, gosh, we've lost half our doctors this year and three quarters of our nurses to Germany, Britain, France, etc. They raised the salaries by 70%. And the reason they could was because they got lots of money being a recipient of EU funds with countries like Britain paying into the system. We took the nurses they paid to educate, the doctors, and we gave them money, and that money went back to Romania so they could put the salaries oh, listen, up. who's right. the we in so, this conversation? So you're sets, British, which, aren't you? Th that works. That works, OK, when you're in a system where you have to reciprocate and give back. But if now, because we're no longer in the EU, we go to countries like Zimbabwe, like the Gambia, and we just take their well, nurses. Well, We're giving nothing back. They're paid. They're, those nurses well, are. Lots of people who having... can't work here send money back to the country they've That's come from. It's not the same. It's That's enormous, enormous not flows the same, of cash. Jacob. Okay, let's leave as, it as, to the people. Le for... Let's leave it to the people of Zimbabwe and Gambia to make up their mind that when they're offered these these opportunities, not only financial, not but fair. also in terms of not fair, freedom. What, why? Do you, do you know what in what because sense because, is it not fair? You if you are offered more money, you're always boasting to me about how much you get paid for giving your views on royals. God you up your money all the time. These people are making great I, advances I do, in their lives, I and I strongly, wish them well. I believe I, strongly in the freedom of movement. But if we are going freedom to, go of, to freedom of your go, own cash, you don't are, mind that. If we are going to go to Zimbabwe and take a nurse that has been educated in Zimbabwe from the age of four, take a nurse. The four, nurse has to decide to come. Yes, but she's received education from the age of five to the age of twenty from the Zimbabwean government. It's only right we pay to train two more nurses in Zimbabwe. I can tell you there was okay. a time. I don't agree with that, but we're going to move on. Thank you to my most pugnacious panel living up to their billing. Coming up, more than 100 legislators have signed a letter calling for the government to ban arms sales to Israel. Plus, I will be exclusively revealing the extent to which what happened to the Baltimore Bridge could happen here in the United Kingdom. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Well, my most pugnacious panel has been arguing the toss over the NHS and colonial immigration, and you've been sending in your mail mogs. Terry says, on incredible buying power of the NHS, why then is this never used to buy even basic medicines, which the public can buy much cheaper over the counter of pharmacies? And Mike says, the NHS has been failing for years, and now the GPs have gone into hiding, is at its worst. There's too much waste, too much diversity training, too many managers, all state systems fail, and the NHS is in the queue. And Ruth says, we should charge a flat fee to access the NHS. We cannot keep treating the entire world for free. More than 100 members of the Lords and Commons have signed a letter calling for an immediate arms embargo on Israel, claiming our most important Middle Eastern ally is committing violations of international war and war crimes. Since 2008, the British government has licensed arms worth more than half a billion pounds to Israel, but as an important ally, surely it is at its time of threat that Israel needs our support more than ever. It seems these signatories don't recognise the distinction between any old country with whom we trade versus a strategically important, ideologically aligned ally in a hostile region. I'm joined now by one of the signatories of uh, that letter, Neil Hanvey. Um, Neil, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Tell me, okay. why have you signed that letter? Well, um, I, I think the situation is now abundantly clear. We had uh, very strong words from the ICJ uh, some, some weeks ago, uh, and we now have a clear instruction uh, from the UN Security Council that uh, they have concerns about continued supply of arms uh, into Israel. And so it's incumbent on us uh, as a member of the UN and uh, as, a, uh, as a country not to support uh, any other country who may be perpetrating uh, either war crimes or indeed crimes against humanity. And uh, those judgments are not being made lightly. Those comments have not been made lightly. And so this is no longer a question of whether this country or that country is our ally or not. It is a, a decision as to whether ministers are prepared to sign off on licenses that could effectively incriminate them as uh, someone who has enabled the commissioning or the perpetration of war crimes. And that Thank is you, the Neil, very... Neil, just, just a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, the ICJ has begun a case it hasn't ruled, and the UN hasn't suggested an arms embargo. It's called for a ceasefire under certain conditions. That's correct. Aren't you, by signing this letter, effectively supporting Hamas? And doesn't Israel have the right to defeat Hamas after the murder of 1,300 innocent people last October? Of course, every country has a right to defend its citizens. That's that's not a, the, the point of the uh, the letter and not the argument that, that I'm making. Um, you know, there have been calls for arms embargoes uh, uh, going back a number of years, not least by my party leader, Alex Salmond, when he was first minister. But the, the situation has changed. This is not a situation where uh, Israel are defending their borders. They are perpetrating a campaign that has seen upwards of 35,000 people lose their lives. Uh, about 70% of them are women and children. This is not uh, about uh, um, defending yourself against combatants. This is uh, uh, the indiscriminate killing of many, many thousand innocent civilians. Now, we know those numbers are, are disputed. Those are the numbers that come from Hamas. 
and that we also know that Hamas is within the civilian population uh, in Gaza. And that's why it seems to me that Israel has the right to root out Hamas, because otherwise Hamas will be able to make these sorts of attacks again in future. And until Hamas is rooted out, Israel remains at threat. And we should therefore be supporting a very close ally. But the, the, the indiscriminate killing of women and children and other civilians is not defence. The uh, withdrawal of food and water and electricity is not defence. Uh, these are very concerning behaviours. Uh, and as an ally, I would have hoped, and I have called on the, the Prime Minister several times at PMQs, uh, to, uh, to, to stand on the side of peace, to end the violence, the death and destruction. However, he has resisted those calls, and those calls haven't come from me uh, personally. One of the, uh, the um, organisations I cited at Prime Minister's Questions was the, the Jewish Voice for Peace, Rabb Peace Rabbinical Council, who have said that the actions that are being perpetrated by the Israeli government are, are completely out of step with their faith and their beliefs. All right. Well, Neil, thank you so much. Thank you for joining me. Uh, much appreciated. Well, I've got my most pugnacious panel still with me, Kelvin McKenzie and Tessa Dunlop. Tessa, this is very difficult, isn't it? Because many people want Israel to win, but they're not willing to will the means for Israel to win. They get squeamish when Israel uses force to win against Hamas. But it must win. Israel must win. I don't really understand in this context what you mean by win. On the one hand, we have Antony Blinken, US Secretary of State, saying far too many Palestinians have died. And on the other hand, we have America, which supplies Israel with 68% of its weaponry. And they carry on supplying their weaponry and at the same time say, stop killing. And they don't seem to make the connection between the two and nor, incidentally, do we. While on the one hand, um, Lord Cameron uses weasel words to implicitly infer Israel's gone far too far. At the same time, as apparently the idea of not selling weapons to them isn't on the table, when on two counts, as I thought, Neil eloquently put it, they are probably breaking international law, both uh, militarily and so too on a human front. And incidentally, Clause 54 of the Geneva Convention, the additional clause, um, is all about proportionality. Now, you're right, it was appalling, October. But what's happened since is disproportionate. Proportionality is very difficult, isn't it? Because we certainly thought at the end of the Second World War that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were proportionate. Yes, actually, they turned out to be a, um, um, uh, the ending of the war. No, and I would still defend them as yeah. being proportionate. And, um, so uh, let's look at where, where we are today. So Hamas, uh, there's, a, there's a piece running in the Telegraph tonight, a disturbing piece in my view, in which uh, there are 24 brigades of Hamas and f they have wiped out 20 of them. Excellent, well done. Uh, Israel, and the, only leaving four brigades behind. Those four brigades are fighting like fury, and it's turned out to be much more difficult to mop up these people. I am wholly in favour of more and more arms going into Israel right. until we wipe them out. And the truth about the matter is, the people of Gaza actually, mm -hmm. oh, really? Hamas have, have, have done what? They, well, I thought we, we thought they were putting a new underground train system in. All these tunnels. Are you, are you surprised that Hamas do so well? Do you know, we have, at the moment, created a whole new generation, a hotbed oh. of recruitment for the next terror. And what do you you think, what do you think the if we left those four brigades deaths. behind? Don't you think the same thing would happen again? The truth is, it's Israel, so Israel, have a say. They want to wipe out Israel. That is, that is an know? essential part of their, their their life, their life force. Uh, uh, I am very much in favour. I want Gaza to have a successful, peaceful existence. They can't have it They're while those four brigades the exist. At the hands of the Israelis, who will not let aid in, are actually denying the will of that, their key why allies. Do they, why do they why do, why do they deny that? Why do they deny the aid? Because the, they the think the arms are, are hidden starving. in the aid. That's why oh, so UNRWA, UNRWA oh. is not a force for good. It is a force for and Hamas. Know, and we know the aid is being taken by the Hamas fighters first. We know that. But actually, we don't. What, on a YouTube video without a date? That's, that, that's, that's your credible source, is it? 
all the organizations that we've been brought up to believe in Oxfam, Christian Aid, Oxfam, Save the Children, Amnesty International, do you, do you all of them have said, oh, stop pieces. dancing on a pinhead, oh, no, darling. No, you no, know. no more broadly. No, 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 no. To okay, say let's, okay, let's incredible. focus then on Oxfam Christian Aid, Save the Children, reputation. Amnesty International. Well, okay, well, let's move on from Oxfam then, if you want to but, derail Oxfam but are you saying Are you saying that Israel haven't got the right to wipe out Hamas. I'm Are you saying, saying that you would allow the Hamas brigades to exist do, within Gaza? Do you, know, do you I, believe that? I was listening to the most incredibly profound right. documentary on Northern Ireland. We need to remember, in the end, we've got to speak to people. Well, we, don't, we don't have All to right. speak to people until 1,300 well, people in a night. These two have to speak to each other every week. It's a trial. But, but before we um, go to messages from our sponsors, I want to do a personal thank you to the Shadow Chancellor, Uma Thurman, I mean uh, Rachel Reeves, for sending me a charming personal letter addressed to my mother, my wife, and to me. Uh, as you can see, she was kind enough to include a picture of herself along with a touching history about her mother's frugality, which is supposedly why she wants to chain the country's finances down to the bureaucratic and incompetent Office for Budget Responsibility, along with the fact that she was once part of the Bank of England's flock of ostriches. I'm sorry to say, Mrs Reeves, that I'm very grateful for your kindness in writing to me. After much deliberation on this occasion, I won't be voting for the Labour Party. It's less to do with the fact that your policies will destroy the country and more to do with the fact that you addressed my mother by her Christian name. Um, next, you'll be calling me Comrade. Anyway, thank you to my panel. Coming up next, the moment you've all been waiting for, it's the moment I exclusively reveal our exchange with the Department of Transport over whether Britain's bridges face imminent collapse. On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., the police are looking into Angela Rayner. Is this a much bigger scandal than the media is making out? The Pakistani flag flies over Westminster Abbey. When did this country stop being Great Britain? Lee Anderson is live in the studio. Will reform ban strikes for healthcare workers? Prince Harry cost the taxpayer half a million pounds in legal fees. Should he have to pay the money himself? And I've got an exclusive involving more of your money on a French migrant fence. Don't miss Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m. Be there. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6 a.m. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit about Sebastian? Um, I just, it really amazes me how a mother um, who can lose a child in such a shocking and unexpected way, so little, so precious, can then turn that grief into something so positive. How did you find the strength to get up, um, get a camera crew, as you say, travel to the other side of the world and investigate all of this? Um, I was angry at Sebastian for dying. Um, you know, you feel like saying, God, I, yeah, 32 years later and I can still get very, very upset about it. I was angry that something, that, that while, he, while he was born and lived with me and slept and then died, they were actively campaigning in New Zealand to try and stop this happening because they had a very high cot death rate there. Um, they had the, the, the lady, uh, the Anne Diamond, if you like, of uh, New Zealand, a, a television presenter called Judy Bailey, went on telly every night and said, if you're just about to put your baby down to sleep, put him on his or her back, not the tummy, and this will help. And there, cot death rate plummeted. And I went out to New Zealand and met her, and it was anger that drove me to come back and demand that we have the same advert here, um, the same campaign. And, of course, I got all this complete nonsense from the Department of Health saying, you know, oh, young mothers do not watch television, I was told. In other words, while New Zealand mums were being told how to save their babies' lives. We actively denied British mums that advice wow. during the time that Sebastian and others were dying. And, and the other point I suppose to make is it's helpful to educate all generations because when I think when I had my mm. babies, my mum would say, oh, he's not settling, just stick him on his tummy, he'll be much happier, that's what we did with you. And we had to say, well, things have changed mm. and, you know, yes. but it's about educating everybody because it's not everybody. just the mums Everybody's... that get their hands on the babies. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? 
incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. Following the devastating collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge yesterday, we've been investigating the state of bridges here in Britain and whether they could face a similar fate to the Baltimore Bridge. We asked the Department of Transport today what steps it is taking to inspect Britain's bridges to ensure they are not at imminent risk of collapse. The Department told us that as this was an isolated incident which hasn't been fully investigated, they wouldn't be commenting. They also pointed out that each bridge has its own unique structure and is looked after by specific local authorities. Where does this leave some of our most cherished architectural wonders? Does this mean that, like of the Clifton Suspension Bridge, I mean, it's quite high up, so it seems pretty unlikely, the Dartford Crossing, Tower Bridge and the Humber Bridge are potentially vulnerable? These feats of engineering and design are significant landmarks in Britain. Perhaps surprisingly, the history of bridges is also particularly interesting. Take Old London Bridge, which was once the longest inhabited bridge in Europe, lined by shops, houses and a chapel at various points in its history. Well, joining me now is the architect and editor of Living Bridges, the inhabited bridge, past, present and future, Peter Murray. Peter, thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure. It seems very unlikely that one of our bridges could suffer a similar fate. Is that, is that fair, in your opinion? I, I think highly unlikely, largely because most of our larger ports that would have the big sort of ship you saw in Baltimore uh, are, have a direct sea access. So whether it's Tilbury, Tilbury or Felixstowe, Tyne Tees, uh, Liverpool, uh, Avonmouth, all those have direct sea access. There's, there, there's one smaller port which... Uh, where ships go under a bridge, and that's at Ipswich. So the uh, the River Orwell feeds Ipswich. So uh, so it's much smaller than Felixstowe, which is at the uh, mouth of the river. So the Orwell Bridge is, is rather fantastic. I'm very high. Uh, has two columns which go into the river, but you can see that at the base of it, it has this large expanse of of, of, of concrete and uh, uh, a sort of solid island base around it, so that any ship coming up to it would uh, would hit this would 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 be pushed upwards, slow it down, and unlikely to damage the bridge. But as I say, the the, the, the ships there are much smaller than you would get as the one in Baltimore. And um, what happened in Baltimore was so shocking because it was so quick that it just went down straight away, whereas you would have thought it might have tottered for a bit. I mean, it, the, the speed of it was really very remarkable. Yes, they had this con continuous structure, really. Uh, uh, quite a lot of bridges would have uh, would have split structures and they, uh, you might lose one piece but wouldn't lose the lot. But they, they had this continuous structure like that and it did come down very quickly. And, and I, I think that, uh, that bit of uh, video of that coming down will be something which will instruct engineers on how to design and how not to design for years to come. And it's not a very... Ancient bridge. I mean, we've got some much older bridges, Clifton Suspension Bridge, for example, than this bridge, which I think was a 1970s bridge. It was. And as you say, not, 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 not very old. And actually, the Orwell Bridge was only uh, built about four or five years afterwards. So 
designed probably around the same time, but the Orwell Bridge was designed in order to protect the, the, the columns. And it seems, and, and certainly reports from America suggest, that uh, the Baltimore Bridge did not have great protection at, at its base, which it should have done. But if, if, if you look at somewhere like Liverpool, you see, I'm Liv Liverpool, the, the Kingsway Tunnel, which was only built uh, back in, I, I think, 1974, um, could have been that uh, Liverpool would have liked to have had a large bridge over uh, the, the, the river there, uh, but a, a tunnel is more expensive to build, but actually is in the end safer because there's no chance of anyone bumping into it. Into it. But there are, as you say, means, as with the Orwell Bridge, of protecting bridges so that even if a very large container ship goes into it, it would sort of bounce off rather than just knock the whole structure down. Yes, but you've got to realise the kinetic energy built up in these uh, ships is absolutely Enormous, massive yes. actually, and, and really hard to uh, protect. You have to have really massive structures to do that, and the best way is to keep the ships away from them. Uh, indeed, so therefore having the direct sea access is, is a help, though obviously in a bigger country like the US not always possible. No, but you, you see, if you look at Baltimore, it's quite interesting because it, it sort of tucked away in, in, in a bay. Uh, it, it, it was a real pain in the neck to the British when they were fighting it's the, the Americans. Bay. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 you can see, if you look at the plan of Baltimore, uh, there's the fort uh, which uh, the, the, the British attacked uh, and, and were actually beaten off in the Battle of Baltimore. And uh, so Francis Scott Key, who, after whom the bridge was named, was actually... Uh, stuck on a British ship while the battle was taking place. And uh, that's what inspired him to write The Star-Spangled Banner, which uh, we, of course, all know about. We, we all know about, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and your history of bridges, you've spent a lifetime studying this. Um, do you think that bridges are less interesting now that people don't live on them and we don't have the excitement that there used to be on London Bridge? I, I, I would say generally bridge design at the moment is, is very exciting because you, you, you have uh, designers and architects getting together with engineers to create uh, more, more spectacular bridges, whether it's in Newcastle or in the south of France, the Mino Bridge uh, by uh, Norman it's Foster. Very famous, yes. Very famous, very elegant, uh, you know, very, very beautiful bridge. Uh, there are lots of them. and But I think living bridges are actually very interesting at the moment because uh, I organised an exhibition at the Royal Academy uh, back in... In, uh, uh, 1998 it was now and uh, the architect Zaha Hadid uh, it was a competition who, and uh, one winner uh, proposed a garden bridge which was attempted yes, later yes, yes. Uh, unsuccessfully but also then the architect Zaha Hadid suggested a series of uh, a, 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 a bridge which would include apartments okay thank you very much indeed Peter that's all from me up next is Patrick Christie's Patrick what have you got on the bill of fare this evening well why was the Pakistan flag flying Flying over Westminster Abbey during Lent. Will the police investigate Angela Rayner again? Will Starmer be investigated? Yet again, big trouble at the top of the Labour Party, potentially an exclusive for you on more taxpayers' money being spent on a completely pointless migrant deterrent in France. And I'll have all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages tonight as uh, well. That Splendid, Patrick. That's all coming up after the weather. I'll be a master of the last supper tomorrow at 8 o'clock tomorrow evening, and I'm sure all of my Catholic viewers will be doing the same. You will have to watch Tom Harwood, who is kindly standing in for me, when the programme is repeated at 1 o'clock. Or you can, of course, if you're technologically sophisticated, record it. We're now coming up to the weather. In Somerset, it's going to be glorious. An Easter sunshine unknown since time began will be with us. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. The weather continues to throw pretty much everything at us. Further heavy downpours tomorrow, snow in places and some gusty winds along the south coast. Thanks to this area of low pressure, bounds of showers have been spreading across the country throughout the past 24 hours or so. And another one spreading north tonight will bring some wet weather across southern England, south Wales. And that will develop some snow, perhaps over the West Midlands, certainly parts of Gloucestershire, Herefordshire and into uh, central and then 
northern parts of Wales. Mostly over the hills, the snow, but there could be some at lower levels. Heavy rain for many elsewhere. As the rain clears from Scotland and Northern Ireland, some pockets of frost certainly likely here. And then we look at the winds picking up along the south coast. A very blustery day to come tomorrow. Met Office yellow warning in place for the winds here. And for the rain in Northern Ireland, caused some problems today with more rain and hill snow here tomorrow. Again, that could cause further disruption. Nowhere immune from the downpours, though, during Thursday. And uh, for most of us, going to feel pretty chilly as well. Temperatures while well, struggling to get to double digits and feeling colder with the wind and the rain. As we go through the long weekend, signs of the weather getting at least a little drier. Better chance of seeing some sunshine on Good Friday, particularly over northern England and eastern England in the morning. Showers will develop almost everywhere by the afternoon. Fewer showers on Saturday and Easter day at this stage looking largely dry and sunny of things at least turning just a little warmer. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening, welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. The weather continues to throw pretty much everything at us. Further heavy downpours tomorrow, snow in places and some gusty winds along the south coast thanks to this area of low pressure. Bounds of showers have been spreading across the country throughout the past 24 hours or so. And another one spreading north tonight will bring some wet weather across southern England, south Wales. And that will develop some snow, perhaps over the West Midlands, certainly parts of Gloucestershire, Herefordshire and into uh, central and then northern parts of Wales. Mostly over the hills, the snow, but there could be some at lower levels. Heavy rain for many elsewhere. As the rain clears from Scotland and Northern Ireland, some pockets of frost certainly likely here. And then we look at the winds picking up along the south coast. A very blustery day to come tomorrow. Met Office yellow warning in place for the winds here. And for the rain in Northern Ireland, cause some problems today with more rain and hill snow here tomorrow. Again, that could cause further disruption. Nowhere immune from the downpours, though, during Thursday. And uh, for most of us, going to feel pretty chilly as well. Temperatures while well, struggling to get to double digits and feeling colder with the wind and the rain. As we go through the long weekend, signs of the weather getting at least a little drier. Better chance of seeing some sunshine on Good Friday, particularly over northern England and eastern England in the morning. Showers will develop almost everywhere by the afternoon. Fewer showers on Saturday and Easter day at this stage looking largely dry and signs of things at least turning just a little warmer. Dubes and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Um, the Guardian's not happy, any, everybody, because uh, one of their headline stories today was about a private members club uh, that is for gentlemen only, the Garrick Club I refer to in London. Uh, there's accusations now, Quinton, that it's all the kind of upper echelons of society, all the, the powerful... It's a cabal elite. of important, powerful people who are running the country. And I thought to myself, <laughs> when I heard descriptions like that, I bet Quentin Letts is somehow involved. 